Look, what I, I wanted to do today really was to tell you uh, a story about uh, an initiative which, uh, which I guess I led starting in 2016 in the Solomon Islands. Uh, it's an attempt to preserve biodiversity, sequester carbon and assist in community development in a re remote community. And the reason I want to speak to you about that was that I think it's got a lot of lessons, that journey that we all took together to achieve that project. It has a lot of lessons for anyone who's engaged with developing countries and also um, anyone in Australia facing the situation we face at the moment with the voice referendum, which I'll refer to towards the end. So let me just um, begin by outlining the, where we are in terms of the climate and why this project was so important uh, to me to get moving in 2016. So we're really reaching a critical point in terms of addressing climate change. Uh, it looks like Earth will reach an average temperature of about one and a half degrees above the pre-industrial average this year or maybe next. And that is very bad news because that's the where we we're aiming. We we're hoping to stop warming, but it's going to go beyond that. Uh, and the weather events that we've seen this year as a result of that warming um, are likely to be the norm by the early 2030s. The kind of extremes that we have today will be the norm by the 2030s and the extremes will be something we haven't yet experienced. And current reduction efforts will see temperatures rise to about 2.7 above industrial average. So we need to redouble our efforts to cut emissions. It's increasingly realised that some sort of drawdown is needed. All of the... Um, all of the, the IPCC's projections incorporate some degree of drawdown, and these figures here give you a bit of a sense of where they are. But the, 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 the form of drawdown that I'm particularly interested in, um, which I think we can make a difference at relatively quickly, is reforestation, using the protection of forests and the regrowing of forests to draw additional carbon out of the atmosphere. A report was published uh, just earlier this year which for the first time ever quantified the amount of carbon we're pulling out of the atmosphere by protecting forests and regrowing forests. And it's in, on the order of 2 billion tonnes a year, which was a surprisingly large figure for me. I didn't realise we were doing such a good job globally at that. Um, but the report also pointed out that we need to increase those figures by about 50% if we're to have a hope of staying below 2 degrees C of warming. That's assuming you know, that the drawdown does its bit and we also cut emissions uh, as well. So it was really with that sense that we need to protect forests that we engaged with this um, work in the Solomon Islands. Now, for those of you who don't know the region, um, I wish uh, this, is, this is Papua New Guinea. I don't have a pointer, but or maybe it's on this. No, anyway, I'm not going to touch it. Something might go wrong. Uh, <laughs> Papua New Guinea, there's the Solomon Islands there, and here is the island of Malaita in the Solomons, and the area that we are talking about is sort of in, in this region here on the, on the east coast of Malaita. The Solomons are pretty special. They're an ancient group of oceanic islands. Uh, they've probably been above the water for 50 odd million years. They're covered in rainforest. Their biodiversity is extraordinary. They really are the Southwest Pacific Scalapagus with a whole lot of unique creatures. And of course, they're under threat. There's been a lot of logging going on and there's been biodiversity loss over the years. And just to give you a sense of why biologists like me get excited about this sort of place, uh, this is one of the creatures found only in the Solomon Islands. It's the world's largest skink, um, but it's ecologically a monkey. Lives in the treetops, got prehensile tails and eats leaves and fruit. So it's a really, really special animal and its genetics suggest that it's been out in the Solomons probably for about 50 million years. It's one of the early groups to have got out there. Its nearest relatives are these little guys here, the crocodile skinks. Um, again, found only in the Solomons and the Bismarck Archipelago in this case. These are carnivores though, smallish carnivores. Um, but again, uh, a unique and a unique species, the only skink with a loud call. And the frogs in the Solomons, again, they've been out there a very long time and there's a lot of biodiversity. Uh, in, in the region, in the frogs. There's enormous frogs, there's little leaf-like frogs like this guy here, huge diversity that has really radiated over tens of millions of years on those rainforest islands. And Western scientists are still discovering um, species in the Solomons. This, uh, this giant rat uh, from Western province was only discovered and named in 2017. 
tragically, it's a, it was discovered as a result of logging. You know, people were, were cutting down old growth and um, one tree fell and um, out of the hollow in that tree came this, uh, the only known specimen of this giant rat that we know about. So there's still things to be discovered. But as we discover them, we document extinctions as well. Um, this pigeon here from the island of Choisel became extinct around uh, 1904, one of the earlier extinctions, but the extinctions continue. So that's just a background about why, why I, I was interested. Um, the thing I hadn't really studied before I started this project was the colonial history of the Solomon Islands. It turned out to be critically important, however, to understand this in order to run a successful project. So the place was a British colony from 1893 to 1977. Um, and the British were there for one reason and one reason only, which was to make money. So they um, set up plantation houses like this one uh, and uh, uh, planted coconut plantations. The thing that they needed though was cheap labour and why would you work on a plantation if you can live perfectly well as a Solomon Islander in your village? This was the problem they faced. So they decided to introduce a poll tax. So the tax that they introduced was um, the equivalent of six months worth of plantation labour for every male Solomon Islander. So what they were saying is we'll enslave you for six months of the year, you pay your tax and for the other six months you're free to do whatever you want to do. On Malaita, this was taken very badly back in 1926. Um, Ramo, the kind of warriors really of the, of the Quayo people, are fierce and independent people. They had also had decades of experience of blackbirding, and this is a practice whereby ships would come, call on the Malaita coast, uh, induce young men and boys to, to board, and then take them off for forced labour in the, the cane fields of Queensland. So, they weren't going to have anything to do with this, this tax. And the British knew it, and the British were sufficiently worried that they sent in a tax collecting party. It's a bit, it's not really the ATO, but there they are. They were all 17 of them, uh, uh, armed with the, the latest rifles that the British could afford, Henry Martini rifles, repeating rifles. Um, and they were um, up against a group of people who were basically armed with bows and arrows, the, the, um, the Quayo. So the Quayo came down to the coast. They were led by a man called Bassiana. This may or may not be Bassiana. He's certainly one of the chiefs of the time. And Bassiana was a brilliant strategist. He had laid a plan to kill all of those tax collectors because uh, they lived way up in the mountains. They felt they might be safe from any reprisals. Uh, and the plan worked brilliantly. They managed to kill all 17 of the tax collectors um, with the loss of a single person on their own side. And here is the graves of the two European tax collectors, Bell and Lilies. The others were Solomon Islanders, uh, armed um, I don't know, police, were constables, whoever they were. Um, the British panicked at this um, terrible uh, attack, as they saw it, upon law and order. And they asked the Australian government to take reprisal action. And the Australian government sent HMAS Adelaide into the Solomons, into... Sinalagu Harbour, uh, where in Quayo territory, carrying a militia, an armed militia, in 1927. And um, this was a spectacularly unsuccessful effort. Um, they, they, they did try sending the army up into the mountains, but it's a thousand metre climb, and the army became known as a breathless army by the time they got to the top. They, everyone had fled, and Bassiana thought things were good. But the British were a bit more cunning than that, and in the end, they ended up giving all of the armaments from the Breathless Army to a group of people who the Quayo were temporarily at war with. And those people, of course, armed with the latest rifles, were able to do terrible damage to the Quayo people. And uh, after a couple of months, Bassiana and his two sons decided they needed to give themselves up. And they walked down to the coast to try to sue for peace. And the British, in their inimitable way, took them to an offshore island, gave them a mock trial and hung them, hung all three of them, which was the end of the kind of any attempt really at reconciling this. So that was the situation that we arrived in, really, in the Solomons. Um, warfare, as far as the Quayo were concerned, had been going on uh, ever since. There'd been no end to this conflict, no reconciliation. 
um, it, despite the efforts of people to do so. So this is a, excuse the kind of colonial look of this photo, it's an old instamatic from 1987. These are the people who helped us carry our gear up into the mountains on my first visit there in 1987. I was invited up by a chief called Folafo of Nalfe village and Folafo had been trying to effect a reconciliation and I think his invitation for us to, to arrive was part of a plan to do that, but he could never get the momentum up to get this reconciliation happening. So I've got to fast forward now to 2015. Um, I was working in Switzerland with a, 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 a foundation developed to protect wildlife and they asked me if I knew of any projects that might be of interest and I said, perhaps we should try to work in the Solomon Islands. It's an area which has been um, neglected and there's great biodiversity there and people are in great need. So the board of this foundation, excuse me. sorry about that, um, <laughs> of all things. So the board of the foundation um, gave us a grant of about 400,000 euros over three years to do a proper engagement and work with, with the Quayo people. Um, this is the Quayo forest we were trying to protect. At the time we were initially invited in um, through uh, the good graces of David McLaren, of James Cook University and Chief Esau Kakao um, the, the, the pristine forest was really pretty much restricted to the high mountains. Um, it, it's beautiful forest, but it was under threat. There were, there were logging trucks uh, waiting down below really uh, to gain access. And loggers in the Solomons, they're usually Southeast Asian companies or Chinese companies, and they drive their trucks in, they'll wait for a couple of weeks, and if the trucks have been left unmolested, often they'll go in and just start logging. Um, in this case, people took um, um, burnable combustible materials, piled them up around the trucks and burnt them all. The coyote decided they weren't going to have any of the logging. And the, the companies were offering something like about 100 Solomon's dollars a head um, for everyone in exchange for the logs, which is not a great deal of money. The forests that remain, though, have these endemic birds in them, um, and they were a new species of rail, and they were really the basis, along with mammals, of our work. And the way we worked was we, we formed an association with the Quayo people. Uh, we invited them to come to the Australian Museum, paid their way. They came and saw what we were doing. We went and visited them and tried to understand what they wanted, and slowly came towards an understanding. And that understanding was that we would help the Quayo people um, protect their forest, monitor their biodiversity in a way that was satisfying to the funder, to this uh, Swiss foundation, um, and eventually help them set up a, a, a legally incorporated association that would then receive more funding. So we were going along very well for about 18 months until Chief Esau Kakaobata came to me and said, we have a problem. He said, your people aren't safe anymore. There is, you know, there's still the war is still going on. And he pointed out to me that um, at least, probably this may be the, like, the most recent murder, but there was an Australian missionary murdered in 2003. And what happened, he was working at a, a hospital quite near where we were intending to work. And one evening in the kind of dusk, a young man came down with a bush knife and beheaded him. And it seemed mysterious, no one could understand what had happened. But we discovered later on that that young man had had a dream in which his grandfather had come to him saying not enough blood's been paid for my death at the hands of the British and he then felt obligated to go and balance the books if you want. So that was the sort of thing that was going on. Um, Chief Esau's son was, was stabbed at, uh, while he was at school as a result of these ongoing conflicts. It was a very difficult situation for people. So Esau decided in February 2018 that we needed to undergo a reconciliation ceremony in order to continue the work, the biological work and the community development work that was being done. For uh, weeks, in fact for months, he walked between small settlements and Quayo people are, there's really family groups camped out in the forest. So there's many, many of these small settlements you've got to get around to and speak to everyone. And it's extremely difficult work Often people don't want to hear about reconciliation. So he would go in uh, with his son um, and, and uh, Tommy, Tommy Esau, and talk about the conservation project as a way of opening the door. And then to say, we can't continue with this until we deal with 
with reconciliation. So by July 2018, Esau felt confident to um, conduct the ceremony. I had agreed to take part with it. We were meant to have the High Commissioner from the Solomon uh, from the UK, the High Commissioner from Australia, and various other important people. None of whom turned up, unfortunately. It seems that government doesn't play a role in reconciliation simply because it's an admission of liability at some level. So it needed to be non-government. And because I was Australian of the Year, I was and had, had gained this funding, I was considered a fair substitute for government. Um, it was really some of the toughest work I'd ever done. July is the middle of the wet season. Um, and after a four day journey by airplane, truck and canoe, we finally arrived at a hut on the coast. And Esau was sitting in the hut looking pretty grim. And he said, well, 90% of people have agreed. He said, so we, we, we can go ahead. He said, you have to have an armed guard before the ceremony is complete. So we nominated eight young men to guard me with bows and arrows and whatever else. Um, and we set off walking. Um, and it's a, the, the mountains, the villages are about a thousand metres up in the mountains. And in the middle of the wet season, it is really tough work getting there. We started pretty much before dawn and finished after dark. But that's kind of what I looked like at the end of it. I was, it was really, really tough. I can tell you, I was 62 at the time. I didn't think... Um, at times I was going to make it. But anyway, so we got up to the ridge above the village just after dark. Esau said, that's where you've got to leave your clothes behind because this is a traditional ceremony. You'll dress like the rest of us in a leaf, which, which I did. And we spent the next 10 days uh, in a leaf. I spent the next 10 days in a leaf. So that's Esau there and myself just in a cook, cooking house there. Um, just to introduce you to some of the major players in the reconciliation, we have... Um, the chief of the village who was on my right, his wife on my far left, um, Chief Esau, and um, the bloke on the far right is the last Ramo from the area, who was the last guy who would really take bounty in order to sort out problems between people. So the following morning after having got to the village, um, we then had to set off to uh, a a very rugged limestone area, which was where the ancestral shrine of Bassiana, the man who'd led the revolt, was located. It was the most moving day that I can remember spending. Um, I went into the forest with, um, with, with um, David McLaren and with um, a group of about 30 older Quayo men who were going to participate in the ceremony. Um, it was raining all day. I remember we got into this very rugged karstic topography and I saw a man in front of me who was the uh, guy who was going to do the ceremony and he had been sequestering himself for several months in preparation to do this, this ceremony. Um, he had a string of human teeth around his neck, a, 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 a leaf, and as we approached he started chanting and um, he got to a certain word in the chant, of course I couldn't understand it, it's all in quayo. And I heard this kind of cry, this groan, really, behind me. And uh, I turned around and one of the older men had sort of fallen down. And uh, it w I understood afterwards that th that word that he'd said at that moment was the name of that man's son. And that at that moment, that man was no longer allowed to take vengeance for the death of his son, that he pledged before the ancestors not to take vengeance. And we, uh, th uh, there was a certain point then where we had to stop. I had to chew a betel nut. Um, the, the, the master of ceremonies had to chew betel nut. We took a small living piglet and it was thrown into a sinkhole, a vast hole in the ground. Um, it, and various other things were done. And that went on all day. It was hundreds of, over 200 names were read out of people who had died as a result of this colonial uh, aggression. Uh, at, the, at the end of that, I came back into the village and my armed guard was no longer needed. And I said to Esau, are you sure everyone will abide by this? He said, yeah, we're not like Christians. He said, we, when we pledge before the ancestors, there's no going back. You can go to confession and, and, and just do it again. But we can't. The ancestors don't forgive if we uh, transgress. So the next few days after that were involved. Well, there's, there's Chief Esau and myself uh, the following morning. And Esau was just ecstatic because he had done something that 
many people had wanted to do but couldn't, couldn't do. A critical moment in the ceremony came when this Ramo, um, we were all waiting for him to speak. We had a series of interventions of things <coughs> going on, um, but he had remained silent. And finally, late in the afternoon, he had a beautiful club in late club, and he was hitting it in the palm of his hand as if to kind of draw attention, I guess, to himself. So that everyone fell silent. And um, he just said six simple words or whatever. He said that the time of killing is finished, the time of peace has come. And that was this moment where everyone sort of could feel the breath, the importance of this, this moment to everyone, that, that in fact peace was going to hold. So we then had a series of um, uh, ceremonies where we paid in pigs for the death of Bassiana and his sons and several other important men seven of them, and they were individual um, payments made during quite a solemn and profound ceremony. And then, maybe it's the next one, sorry. No, it's not. Um, and then I was paid in shell money for the Australians who'd been killed. And in the end, I had a very large amount of shell money. I put them, married 50 quayo maidens probably with that amount of money. I don't know, but it was a lot of money. Um, and so I, I took all of that, eventually ended up in the Australian Museum, but we were paid for all of the people who had died as a result. So that was sort of the, the, the nitty gritty of the ceremony, which was three or four days. The other six days were really celebrations, exhortatory speeches, dances, eating, although much food was still tabooed, meat was tabooed and various other foods. So it was a very limited menu. Um, but as it was raining, a lot of it was inside um, flute playing, which is the beautiful, beautiful flute music in this area. And I just have a little video here, or oh, maybe the lead one, there we go. <laughs> So clearly a very strong traditional culture had made a reconciliation really possible with 4,000 Quayo and with the Australian government and people. Um, when we finished uh, after the 10 days, I was walking down the mountain and um, this old man on my, um, my left was waiting about five hours walk down the mountain. And he had very bad arthritis in both knees and he said to us, in pigeon English, which I understand, he said, I couldn't come to the ceremony because of my bad knees, but I want to make compensation payment. And he pulled out of his bill and there, this, um, you can see the shell money that David's holding with me, this pink shell money, which was really rare and valuable in, in Quayo. And the, the younger Quayo who were with us really was kind of like, wow, it was like they were looking at a Mercedes Benz or something. It's obviously much more valuable than the, the white shell money that we'd received. Um, previously. I never worked out what the old man had done that he felt he had to make payment. Um, but what did happen was we, um, as he was handing over the money, um, this eagle appeared over the ridge from the direction that we'd come from, from up the hill, and flew down beside us and followed the path we were going to follow all the way down to the coast. And um, the other so the other quail there were kind of like, wow, this is exceptional. I'd never seen the eagle before. It's a species called the Solomon Islands eagle, um, which I can show you there. It's endemic to the Solomons. It's a rare bird. It really is a large predator. It's quite rare. And for the quail, it has special symbolic meaning that I don't really understand. But it was as if we'd been blessed, really, by the presence of this eagle. It was very significant to people that this was what had happened. <coughs> So before I go through this, I just say we, 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 it was a very long journey to get back to Alki, which is the regional capital. The wet season was unbelievably bad. The road is shocking across to the east coast. But we did finally make it back after several pretty much sleepless nights. Uh, and Chief Esau said, I've got to tell you a few things about this ceremony. And I said, oh, thank you. It'd be good. Good to know. And 
He said, well, look, I wasn't always a good person, he said to me. He said, um, in fact, when I was a child, I was a pig thief, and I had stolen 87 pigs. I said, wow, that's pretty good total, isn't it? He said, yes, but I stopped stealing pigs because in my culture, if you steal 100 pigs, you have to kill someone, and I didn't want to kill anyone. And he said, instead, I became a bank robber in Honiara. And so he put himself a shotgun and he said, I robbed, robbed three banks and we did very well. And he said, I stole my wife, Dorothy, at gunpoint from her clan. She, I think Dorothy wanted to be with him, but nevertheless, that was kind of part of what was happening. Uh, and he said, and so I understand that need to redeem people. And he said that um, those eight young men who you were, were your bodyguards, he said, they were the worst rascals in all of he said, though, and the head one, the guy with the reddish hair, he was the man who'd killed the missionary back in 2003. And he said, I needed to give them a job where they had responsibility and buy in, but also where I could keep an eye on them. He said, That's why I did it that way. And so I said, Well, thank you for telling me now. <laughs> All good. Um, so it was a very interesting interesting thing to see. Chief Esau is a very unusual person and we should, I, I, it just taught me never, never write anyone off. And it's, it's interesting now, that guy with the reddish hair that was the, the, the kind of the chief bodyguard and the one that killed the Australian, he is now the man going out into new villages to spread the word of reconciliation, which is dangerous because you're going into enemy territory. You're going to go there and expose yourself. But he's the one who's taken this on himself as an act of leadership to continue to ripple out the reconciliation across the island. So um, about four years ago now, three years ago, we, um, I got some more funding to incorporate a, a thing called the Baru Conservation Alliance, which is a, run by the Quayo people. It's incorporated under Solomon Islands law. It has, a proper, it has proper gender representation, which was the only thing we asked, that men and women be represented equally on the board. Um, it's fully accountable, it, it, proper border management, it's got an audit, auditor, um, the money is, is used responsibly, and it now handles grants of 100,000 Australian dollars plus per year for various projects that relate to both conservation and community development. So we've sort of handed the project over. Of course, we're still there as potential partners at the Australian Museum, but the project is now run really by Solomon Islanders, for Solomon Islanders. Um, the area of protected forest continues to grow as Quayo leaders say this area really needs to be protected or this, or we want to do this, we've noticed a rare bird here, we want to protect that area. And the reconciliation continues to ripple out. Um, as of earlier in the year through North Malaita, but Chief Esau has ambitions and aspirations to take it to Guadalcanal, where as you know there was fighting between the Malaitans and the Guadalcanal people a decade or two ago that, that caused all sorts of problems. And Esau's vision is that the reconciliation ultimately needs to cover the whole Solomons. But we shall see where all of that goes. So that is all I wanted to talk about in terms of the Solomons, but I'll just take a few minutes to, to talk about our voice proposal. So when... I'm a great supporter of the voice, as you can tell from my badge. <laughs> but I know that no referendum has ever passed in Australia where the opposition has opposed it. And when you look at the figures for the voice referendum as they stand today, the yes vote is continuing to decline. So we're going to wake up on the morning of the 15th of October as a nation facing an agonising dilemma, knowing that we've let down our Indigenous people here. Um, and that that will be very painful and difficult for us all. I, I just think the first thing that this experience in the Solomons taught me is never say no. Yes, Chief Folifo could never get the reconciliation together, but Chief Esau Kakarabatha did after 91 years. These things take time and they take an enormous amount of work. If we were to take that Solomons template and apply it to Australia, the best thing we could do is after the referendum, reach out to our Indigenous communities in a way we've never done before. Make a pledge to reach and listen to every single Indigenous group in this country, not with government representatives, but with the best of us, with 
representatives from the academies of arts and sciences, and from the sports, from all of the regions, all of our associations that have something to offer. And over a number of years, perhaps, who knows, months, I don't know how long it would take, go out to those communities and listen humbly to what they have to say about their past, their present condition, and their future, their aspirations, and bring all of that back to Australia as a whole. So we could then understand and have a common basis for moving forward. Of course, there'll be Indigenous people who will disagree with whatever happens, but no one then will be able to say they haven't been consulted. It's that depth of hard work that needs to be done, brave work that needs to be done, um, to make any reconciliation actually work. Once, those, once you had that, of course, the government could take those results in any way they wanted. They're not bound to do anything, but it would form a, a strong and enduring basis for any further steps we wish to take in terms of reconciling with our Indigenous communities here in Australia. That's all I've got to say.